Uh, so my name's Alex. I'm a principal engineer at Atlassian, and I work on the design system team there. Okay, so React, beautiful, drag and drop. Uh, React, beautiful, d, &D. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I was lucky enough to spend about two years full-time working on this library, and I am super proud of it. Uh, it, it looks great. And I've been able to speak at React Sydney many times about it. And I've also been, was lucky enough to speak at React Conf in 2020, in the pre-COVID times, uh, just before that. Yeah, about how it all kind of works. And React's beautiful drag and drop feels great. Like, I don't know if you've used it, I have, and it's awesome. Like, if you haven't, Definitely check it out. It is a marvel to behold. Okay, it feels great, but it is heavy and limited. So it's a heavy library. So it's 105 kilobytes minified or 30 kilobytes minified and compressed. Uh, it's one big unit. So as new features were added to the library, the library just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger over time. To be fair, bundle size wasn't really its goal. Its goal was how do we create the best feeling, most physical experience possible, and also make it accessible out of the box. Like that was the success criteria, not how small is it. But you know, it is heavy. Um, it's teaching the browser how to do something from scratch, like it's sending all the code down to teach the browser how to do drag and drop in a whole completely different way. Uh, so there's a lot of code there. And, and it's limited, right? So React Beautiful D&D was designed to work for lists and lists of lists, so like boards, and basically anything else you can kind of force into be a list-like abstraction. But a lot of drag and drop does not fall into that category. So what does that mean? It means that makers, say like where I work at Atlassian, if they find something that a drag and drop they need to add that isn't a list, they end up having to either create or find another library, right, to do drag and drop for that problem, which kind of feeds into that heaviness because now, say our product might have to ship React Beautiful D&D and React D&D and something else, right? So we're now paying for potentially two heavy libraries and maybe some bespoke code as well. Also, React Beautiful D&D, as the name kind of suggests, is tied very closely to React. Like, that's what it was written for, that's what it is. However, like, not every tech stack is React. Even at my workplace at Lassian, where we write all new UI code in, in React, there is a lot of code that is not React, whether that's legacy views, acquisitions, whatever it is, you'd be surprised how much code is not actually in React. And so for those people, they can't use React Beautiful d, &D. It's tied to React. They have to find something else, which kind of makes that problem even worse. You have to find more libraries. So we're asking our users to download more and more code rather than just being able to share a solution across multiple experiences. So not great. So over the last few years at Atlassian, there's been a really big push that I'm very in favor of, of making our products faster. Right? And in this process, React Beautiful d, &D which at that point hadn't been touched for a while by me, um, had been called out as something that was pretty heavy, right? And was slowing down pages. So with that sort of environment, uh, I think it was late, not last, not the year we just had, the year before that, I had an idea for a different take. What if we created a, a new drag and drop solution that was willing to discard maybe the physicality that we find in React Beautiful D&D, and went hard for performance. Like, what would that look like? And that's what we've been working on over at last year, a small team uh, and myself for the last year, working on it, and I'm gonna be sharing that with you tonight. Not only what it is, and, but also how it works and some of the ideas that it has that you can steal and apply to other things. Uh, some disclaimers before I get in, like all solutions make trade-offs. Like if, you know, pragmatic drag and drop is tuned to particular trade-offs. And especially trade-offs that we're experiencing at Latin at scale. Okay, so 
it, if you want it, so it's kind of, you want to kind of, that, even when you're going for performance, you want to find that balance of ergonomics, um, making it kind of good to use, but because if you didn't want to, if you were only interested in exclusively performance, then you'd, you would look very, very different, right? It's kind of like this, this tuning exercise. Um, yeah, I'll come back to trade-offs a bit later. Okay, so, and another kind of disclaimer, like all solutions stand on the shoulders of the solutions that have come before. Like, yeah, uh, we're all learning and I'm sure that what we've created will eventually be superseded by something else that stands on its shoulders, right? It's just sort of a cyclic thing we find in front end or in engineering generally. Okay, now today I'm gonna to be covering a heap of ground, so I'm not gonna be able to go as deep into everything I would like. Maybe I can do that another time. But, so here we go. So how we focus on performance for Pragmatic Dragon. So first technique, uh, use the platform, right? So as I mentioned before, React Beautiful D&D recreates the entire drag and drop experience from scratch. Um, and it does that in order to deliver something that the browser does not ship, which is a physical feeling drag and drop experience. So with Pragmatic Drag and Drop, the idea was, let's see how far we can get by leveraging the browser's built-in drag and drop capabilities. So what do we get for free from the browsers, like drag and drop in the browser? User input. So in Pragmatic D&D, you think, sorry, in React Beautiful D&D, when you put a mouse down, the library doesn't know if you're dragging or not. We look for if the user's moved a certain pixels away after a mouse down to determine whether they were dragging, and then we start the drag. Uh, and there's some interesting logic in there to handle that. Now you get that for free with the platform, right? It determines whether it's a click or a drag, whatever. Like you don't have to write any code for that. You just listen for drag start, right? So all that problem goes away. Uh, hitbox. So in React Beautiful D&D, we build up a virtual mem virtual call it virtual model in memory of all of the entities that we care about. And we then do our, have our own collision engine to determine what's being entered into. Uh, the browser does that for you for free. Um, so it will tell you like what element the user is currently going into. Not as sophisticated as React Beautiful D&D, but it's free, right? You don't have to pay anything for it. You just have to kind of smartly listen to events. You get the events, the updates that will actually tell you when things are changing. And you also get there's a throttle by the browser. All those things, there's a lot of code in React Beautiful D&D to do. And then also drag previews. So with uh, React Beautiful D&D, we actually move an element around with a transform and there's a lot of interesting craziness to, to do that and then moving other things around. With the platform, how that works, you just get that for free, like for the most. You just point at an element, say take a photo of this element and then you drag a photo of that thing around. Very, very minimal code. So there's a lot of stuff you get for free. Um, why isn't everyone using, you know, the platform drag and drop? And honestly, it's because it's a mess. Um, the API is rough, that's a subjective call, but you can probably look up stuff on Google about that. There is an insane amount of inconsistencies uh, across browsers, even though there are standards. It's horrifying how inconsistent browsers are with this particular API. There is lots of bugs. Um, Chrome is actually the worst offender for its bugs, uh, which is surprising, usually they're very good. Uh, and there's a lot of very old bugs, like I don't, I'm hoping, but I'm not holding out hope that that will get fixed, but they're like 10 years, 14 years old kind of bugs. Could they be fixed? Yes, it's an investment in that space. A lack of built-in accessibility, I'll come back to that. Doing drag previews well is a minefield, like I, I'm fairly confident that I discovered novel techniques to actually do that well. And I know the browser pretty well. So I think if you were trying to do that on your own, it would be really, really hard to actually get right. And basically everything about the API is just a huge minefield. Uh, that was sort of how we were warned going into it as well. And that has been true. It's definitely been true. Uh, so what we did make the platform better, this is a whole nother blog, but just while we're here, um, yeah, obviously fix the browser bugs and inconsistencies would be amazing. They're, some of them are very bad. Um, but you wouldn't know with Pragmatic D&D, we hide over that. Um, improve control and ergonomics for drag previews. Improve auto-scrolling. We have our own auto-scroller. 
you want it for Pragmatic Vendee. Uh, allow custom cursor control and publish a new drag finished event. That's just something to do with the fact that if you remove the draggable during the drag, you then have to, you don't get all the events anymore. So anyway, the platform could be better. The platform definitely could be better. And this is kind of in meme form, like how, what it, what it ends up being like. Uh, would, if we fix all those things in the platform, would there be a need for pragmatic drag and drop? Maybe, maybe not. I think it offers kind of a nice API layer around it that I think is, is quite nice to work with. That's a subjective call. Uh, and it would just get smaller when the, those bug fixes were gone. But, you know, if, those, if all those things weren't true, it were better, then maybe the need for this wouldn't exist. Okay, so technique number two, only pay for the features that you need. I mean, I feel like this is like great web performance advice. Web performance advice in general is to not send code to users that they don't that they don't actually need on that page. Uh, yeah, it, you can get pages to start a lot faster by only sending the stuff that they actually need. So React Beautiful DND is a big blob. Everyone gets the whole thing, whereas we've designed pragmatic drag and drop to be incremental. So what does that look like? So it's sort of, I won't go all through all the details, but there are adapters for different dragging different types of things. You've then got add-ons, which you know, do a bit more, add a bit more stuff. And then you've got like all these different utilities that just help with various things you might want to do, whether that's drawing lines, um, scrolling something into view, custom drag, yeah, drag previews, reordering utilities, whatever, right? Uh, and it's been designed so that you kind of compose together these pieces for the experience that you have on your page. So ideally, whatever experience you're trying to create on that page, you're only ever paying the bundle for those features. It's kind of the goal. Uh, technique number three, I am going to talk about what these resulted in, but I just wanted to talk about the techniques up front. Uh, technique number three, experience flexibility. So, yeah, as, we, as I've mentioned before, React Beautiful d and it's, it's, it's been designed to power drag and drop for lists and lists of lists. It also does virtual lists, table row reordering, trees, but in an old major, and you can kind of do limited things, limited changes to the DOM during a drag. It's very limited in what it can do. Uh, pragmatic drag and drop, on the other hand, can do lists, lists of lists, virtual lists, table row reordering, table column reordering, table column resizing, resizing grids, trees drawing, native, uh, basic anything really you can think of, virtual anything you can think of, you can change anything you want during a drag. So anything. Um, anything. <laughs> Any drag and drop kind of thing you want to do, it'll help you do that. So this is regarding performance. It means that in our context where we have lots of different libraries, because we now have this increased flexibility in what this solution can do, we can consolidate these down. We no longer need a library for this, a library for that, a library for that. We can have one library. And the differences between the experiences can be catered for in different add-ons and different utilities. So consumption flexibility. React beautiful DND, tied to React. Pragmatic drag and drop is actually a JavaScript library, not tied to React at all. And you can use it in Svelte, React View, that's Backbone, and just vanilla JS, or so really any view library you want. What does that look like in practice? Here we go, into some code. Here is a React card, and I don't have my little pointer working sadly, but inside that use effect, I'll come back to use effect. Um, so up here, I'm importing, don't worry about the <laughs> package name. It's very, uh, very alpha at the moment. Atlas kit, drag and drop, slash adapter, slash element. Grabbing draggable from that, and then inside this effect, I'm just attaching it to the uh, DOM ref. And then that will make that element draggable. Uh, if you're worried about having effects in your code, you can just hide it behind a, a hook if you want to. Uh, here's the exact same thing, but in Svelte. I have not written Svelte before I wrote this, uh, but yeah, so you, this is achieving the same thing. And this is the same thing again, but just in straight up JavaScript. So what does that look like for us? So Atlassian, it means that at the moment we have all these solutions that we have floating around the place that we can consolidate down to, you know, 
which is great. Uh, all, you know, we can ship a lot less code to, to consumers. Uh, and it should be tech, technique for, but it says approach for lazy loading compatible. So uh, I won't zoom in, but generally when we're talking about loading, you're you're pulling in your drag and drop code as part of your critical bundle, you send that down to the client and then you're kind of ready to go. Uh, that's kind of how everything works. Uh, but how, how we've designed pragmatic drag and drop is that you don't actually have to load it in when the page loads, you can load it in later if you want to. This is probably most useful for something like you have a panel and you have to click a button before edit's enabled and then after that you could load in and then you only allow reordering of something after you're in edit mode. Like there's no point slowing down the page load at that start, you can just load it in later. So we kind of designed that to work and also for it to work outside of React. So this is just doing like dynamic imports just with um, a waiting thing. Modern bundlers support this kind of syntax. This is what you, you can do it like this kind of style in a React component as well. What's really, so what I'm doing here is inside an effect, I've got an async function running, I know, crazy, right? and uh, awaiting this import using an abort controller as well, well, I know wild, uh, but then it eventually starts that draggable. But what's really cool about this is that behavior is being added and React didn't need to re-render, didn't need to swap out a component tree or anything, right? It's just kind of added that behavior. Now, you can, or you can hide that behind suspense kind of APIs as well, that's totally fine, uh, but this will work all over the place. Now, I'd be amiss not to point out that this is actually pretty dangerous and I probably wouldn't recommend doing this for most people because there is a big chance that you may miss an interaction if that load's not quick enough and they tried to drag something while that new code's being loaded in, well, what do you do? Uh, so yeah, it's, it's more for that, that where you have something, a later point in your UI where you enable drag and drop in some way, then pull it in and when it finishes, then you could show something on the UI to indicate that it's ready. Uh, but yeah, it is, that's something I want to experiment with more a little bit. Um, yeah, but it works, but there, it is a bit dangerous. Pragmatic drag and drop is so small, this window is pretty tiny, but it exists. So let's look at the results. Firstly, bundle size. Uh, so React Beautiful d, &D I'll look at the gzip minified one. Uh, React Beautiful d, d 30 kilobytes, got the library down to 4.3 kilobytes, which is seven and a half, 7.5 times faster. There's some other libraries there, but I don't think bundle size is actually like a great measure anyway. Like bundle size is a pretty rough proxy for speed and can be misleading as well. So what I did is I went away and I created this website, which I'll link and I can post on Twitter later too, where what I've done is I've created the same board experience but powered by different drag and drop libraries on different URLs. So this is a Next.js app, there's 48 cards spread across three columns. It's using React 18, I've got to hit React 18.2, Next 13.2.4. Uh, and yeah, so that's what they're running on, that's a production Next app. And they've got all the accessibility stuff wired up as well. So there's no cheating here. These are like, this is not just measuring some arbitrary bundle, this is like actually measuring real kind of apps. Um, so what I did is I created a little, uh, test runner, which is, uh, I'm actually kind of happy with this one, but it's a, a CLI, a CLI, a node script, fancy, uh, that just hits this URL with Lighthouse, 120 times per URL per like throttling um, preset, so one for 120 times mobile, 120 times desktop, and then it restarts Chrome for the next URL and keeps going collects all those results and then spits out the median and spits out any extreme outliers as well. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And so I'm, yeah, I had fun writing that. Um, so what are the results of this? So I actually, here we go. Yeah, mobile, let's talk about that. Yeah, so baseline, baseline is, that's how long it took to, to render without any drag and drop at all. So React Beautiful DND adds 275 milliseconds, React DND 387 milliseconds, Pragmatic Drag and Drop 6 milliseconds. Um, so pretty staggering, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jed, interrupting. Yeah. 
Uh, I've run this test a lot of times. Yeah, and I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, and then on the desktop, uh, even nicer, it was actually kind of oscillating between zero and one millisecond for pragmatic drag and drop. So basically zero cost to get drag and drop capabilities onto the page. And that's not just like the library. That's like that the experience is working. You can do drag and drop and it's got accessibility wired up. So yeah, pretty sweet. Uh, this is, yeah, um, yeah, I'm just gonna, I can't go back. No. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, so super stoked, absolutely stoked. This is a, uh, is this working? Yes, so this is a video of a conversion that a team did, Jira roadmaps, where they converted from React D&D &D over to Pragmatic D&D, &D. so that it's doing the drawing that you saw and it's also doing that reordering uh, and they saw, so that the no experience change, this is in production with you know many, many thousands of users, they saw 130 millisecond improvement to TTI from jumping over. So pretty sweet. Uh, Server-side rendering, uh, really interesting. I've got both the raw and the diff here. We'll look at the diff first, so that's the right-hand side. So what we're doing here is I've taken this board, it actually had, I, I bumped up the cards a little bit just to exacerbate some of the deltas, just to make it a bit clearer. So it's got 99 cards in it, rendering with React server dot render to string. You know, it's not using any fancy server component stuff, it's just doing render to string. How long does that take? Uh, so the baseline, zero milliseconds. You know, React, beautiful DND, basically doubles the amount of time it takes to render um, on the server. Uh, React DND adds a bit as well. Pragmatic drag and drop, 0 0.1 milliseconds difference. So, yeah, pretty massive difference to the time. What does this matter? Like, who cares about this? This is actually really important because this is if you're doing server side rendering, we see the faster you do it, the faster you can start returning data back to your users. So, this is, this is great for it to effectively have no cost on the server. How did that work? How did we get no cost on the server? Well, let me show you. Here we have a completely made up uh, component called item and in it I'm creating something called registry which doesn't exist, I'm just making this up. Use state registry and it's got a function and it's going to do some setup code, cool. So that's setup function on uh, in your React render to string, that setup's going to get cool, right? How now? And that's all good, so that's going to impact server rendering time in some way. Now. What if we did it like this? We have a registry, which is a ref, which is just a bucket to hold values, and inside an effect, my friend, which I'll come back to again, use effect, we do the setup in there, okay? Now that line is, like, it's just not executed at all on the server. So, if you have stuff that you need to set up for your UI to use, but has no impact on the visual appearance, it's only behavior based. Like maybe put it inside an effect, or at least the library you're doing it could put it inside an effect because it just gets completely skipped over on the server. Now I'm very aware that use effect is kind of, you know, gets a lot of <laughs> gets a lot of heat. And I I agree with this. Like most things definitely do not need an effect. However, they have a place which is connecting to an X external system. So use effect purpose, synchronize a component with an external system. What is an external system? Network, some browser API or a third party library not controlled by React. So something that's not controlled by React, pragmatic DND, not controlled by React, this is a way to synchronize with that, boom, ready to go. And again, that's kind of what it looks like. So that whole, all, all that kind of setup codes just on the server doesn't doesn't need to get called at all. So yeah, use effect, it is a useful tool. Would I recommend doing this for all your things? Probably not, but it's an interesting technique for like these very kind of specialized, probably best to leave behind a library, but yeah, interesting to know, you know? If you don't need it on the server, like you can do it in effect if you want to. Okay, so that's kind of what led to this. 
Uh, sort of a meta observation before I keep going, like you can still have a fantastic React experience uh, for engineers without having to offer everything in React. Like React's great, I love React. I've used React for, I don't know, umpteen years now, but you don't have to offer everything in React. You can, and you can even offer something that's not in React and share it behind a React facade for people in React and people will be none the wiser. Uh, this is not an old, this is not a new idea. People have been doing this for a very long time. I think people were even speaking about it at React Conf, uh, the last one. But yeah, this is really, we've, we've seen a lot of power in this, having multiple tech stacks being able to use the same, especially like libraries, like not tying your library to React is actually awesome if you can avoid it, right? Unless it's obviously very tailored to a React problem, it's actually kind of pretty sweet to pull it out from React. Okay, uh, this is just another little one, data over the wire. So this is that 99 cards again. Um, because React Beautiful DND put data attributes on elements as though it's doing a server-side rendering, it actually meant that more data needed to be sent down to the client. So this is kind of a cool learning for me. It's like, well, with drag and pragmatic drag and drop, we don't do that. We add some data attributes. We add some attributes to the DOM once the page has started, but we don't need to server-side render those. That just means you get to send less data down the wire. Right? You don't have to, if you don't need those data attributes straight away, like you can add them later. That's fine. So this is the actual HTML kind of coming down is smaller. Okay, interaction performance. How does it feel to you? So we've talked about like server-side rendering, we've talked about um, application startup time, and I'm gonna talk about, well, how does it feel to you? Like, what's that performance? Now here's a huge diagram that I'm definitely not gonna go into here. But this is all to say that React Beautiful D&D when it starts is pretty complicated and does a lot of things. Uh, and some of those things are expensive, although I do try and minimize that cost quite a lot. Whereas Pragmatic Drag and Drop, on the other hand, is I mean, relatively cheap. Um, that's that. Uh, and then also while the drag is occurring, React Beautiful DND needs to do a lot. Things like it takes the user input, the virtual model, passes that through a collision engine, calculates the drag impact, runs selectors for every single thing that it cares about, doing memoirs selectors, doing state updates where required, it does windowing, it does all this kind of stuff. It does a lot. Uh, and actually does it really well, but it does do a lot. Whereas pragmatic drag and drop, it's, if you saw the last, if you, if you had a mental model of the last one, it's basically the exact same diagram, just calculates the drop target using element.closest, just looks up, super cheap, and then publishes events. And that's it. So, they both run at 60 FPS. <laughs> I did a lot of work with React Beautiful D&D to uh, get it working really well, and it does, like it does work really well. Uh, they both kind of comfortably hit 60 FPS. You'd think that they'd, uh, that pragmatic drag and drop would have better scaling, and it kind of does, but actually the browser starts to really get sluggish when you just throw heap more and more nodes at the page. Like more nodes, like the browser just, it does nothing to do with drag and drop. Like the browser like really starts to chug when you have tens of thousands of elements on the page and you keep building that up. So they, uh, like if you had a line, like yes, probably pragmatic in there would be a little bit better, but they both kind of scale as you get more stuff in the page. Yeah, the browser just doesn't like having too much in there. So, all I have to say, kind of both do really good. But, what about under load? So what do I mean by load? Uh, so what happens when the page is like really struggling? What does that look like? Well, let's think about React Beautiful D&D. So what happens is, for the drag preview, uh, what we do is we use a transform. Um, so we do, we move it around with a CSS, there we go, CSS, ooh yeah, thanks Kino. Uh, CSS transform. And also items that are moving out of the way of the item being dragged also move out of the way with CSS transforms. And they all render on the main thread as part of the browser's standard render cycle. Drag and drop, pragmatic drag and drop, which uses the browser's built-in drag and drop capability on the other hand, can use the native drag preview. So what does that mean? Well, it takes a photo of the element and then that photo is actually put on a completely separate layer to the browser and it can be dragged around by the users. That's why you can drag stuff from like one application in the web to another, 
right? It's actually outside of the browser. It's not part of the browser's render loop anymore. Right, see where this is going. So here is an example I have, which is React Beautiful DD. I have a very evil function in there that's like, th like absolutely smashing the, the browser and causing the frame rate to drop heaps. And you'll, you'll notice with React Beautiful DD, it's just very hard to use. And that's because it's running, the browser's running at 7 FPS, so all the other updates are running at 7 FPS. So it's, this does happen, like let's say you have some other thing on the page that's doing work and you have a few of those things, you know, they can add up, right? Now this is using pragmatic drag and drop. The browser's running at 7 FPS, drag preview's still running at 60 FPS. Because it's not, it's running on a completely separate pro, like process. So that's pretty sweet. Um, now obviously the line that's being drawn is still rend being rendered at 7 FPS, uh, but that's okay. Like you, it's okay that because that line's not changing all the time. The thing that the user's dragging still feels really, really good. So this is a big win, I think, for leaning into the native there. Now, pragmatic drag and drop actually supports a lot of different ways of doing drag preview. So you can do the exact same thing as React Beautiful DND if you want. Um, in fact, we have one that does that. You can use I've got this sort of technique that I came up with where you can take, change the appearance of the item that's being dragged. So you can change this appearance, so like give it a different background color, different border, like whatever you want. And the user, will, it'll, the browser will take a photo of that and you can drag it around. I've also got a utility that makes it safe for you to render a completely different element as the drag preview if you want. Uh, that'll be native as well, so you can drag that between browser windows, or you can completely disable it. Why would you want to completely disable it? Well, did you know that you can do drawing with like drag and drop? Um, yeah, totally. So we're hiding the native drag preview there, but leveraging pragmatic drag and drop for that. It'd be cool if that was another link. On a loop. There we go. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty sweet. My colleague, Jacqueline Wan, created that little example. That's awesome. Resizing, um, yeah, that's using drag and drop. Pretty cool. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can actually do quite a lot with drag and drop. Uh, once you get over the hurdles, the browser puts in the way. Okay, experience. So, I mean, just pivoting a little bit. Obviously, the, this is React Beautiful DND now. Like, yeah, it feels great. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, it feels really cool. I like it. Um, that physical feeling thing, I think, is why people. But then we're going to switch over to React uh, Pragmatic DND, and you'll see it's like a different visual language now. We've sort of embraced the constraints of the platform a bit more, so we use like lines and colors and borders to indicate movement. You know, it's not it's not the physical UI that you're used to in React Beautiful DND. Yeah, like it's a constraint that we, we have embraced in order to ship a whole lot less code and make our apps a lot faster. But a benefit is that, and, and like. Honestly, I'm actually coming around to this because it's so fast. The amount of stuff you can do really, really quickly, if you're not waiting for any kind of any animations at all, it's just like boom, 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 done. I've, I've come around. Uh, this is a tree that we made with React Beautiful DD. And it works. I mean, it does work, and it's okay, but React Beautiful DD was only ever designed for vertical lists. So some like experiences where you're doing like horizontal movement and vertical movement in the same, it just wasn't designed to do it. And it's just can be pretty confusing and pretty hard to actually be successful. Whereas with pragmatic DND, um, this is a tree now being powered by that. Um, yeah, we have like complete freedom about what that experience should look like and hopefully add a lot more clarity to some of these more like complicated experiences, not just ones that are, you know, a list. And you'll see that little, oh, didn't loop, start it again. That little element being rendered off the cursor there, that's a custom element. That's a, it's not actually the element that's being dragged, it's something else, pretty cool. Might write a, write a blog about how I did that. But if you use Pragmatic DND, you don't have to worry, it's all behind an API. I'm getting distracted. Uh, yes, so, we now can do like really anything you want when it comes to hitboxes. Like this is the 
hit box that, that I made uh, for that. Uh, in like, I've been working with the Confluence team on this, like this has been many iterations, but we have like so much flexibility now about what the hit box should be. Like React Beautiful DND is like, this is the hit box, like that's it. Whereas this is, you can kind of do whatever you want. Like it doesn't, it doesn't care about hitboxes at all. Like this is a separate thing, um, which is great. Okay, and while we're talking about experience, I just want to talk about stickiness because I think this is super cool. Uh, so this is React DND. But this is pretty standard. Um, this is a board where what I'm going to do is drag a card. And when I'm in the gaps between cards, you'll notice that the line disappears. And that's because you're technically in the browser like no longer over a drop target. And so it's like, oh, you're not over a drop target anymore. And if you're doing edge, you know, if you're drawing a line based on where you were, what you're over, you're not kind of over a card anymore, so you get lose a line. And then in this case, when I'm between the columns, they're not over any drop target anymore. If you think the column is a drop target, then you don't see anything. So in pragmatic, I, I hate this. If you see me speak, <laughs> yeah, I was talking about these kind of things that re react uh, Sydney before, uh, I hate this. So what I've done is I've actually baked this into pragmatic DND. I think it's pretty important and it touches some of the core algorithms, but you can optionally enable or disable and conditionally change that during the drag as well. Stickiness, so what that means is it will actually remember like a hierarchy of drop targets, even as you leave drop targets. So between the cards, you'll see the line was still there, but most importantly and pretty sweet, when you're between those columns, You've still got your last place remembered. That is sweet because it's remembering not just one level, it's remembering multiple levels of drop targets. And so when you drop, you're never in a place in this experience where you end up where the user's not dropping anywhere. Now you can disable this if you want to, uh, on the fly even, but pretty sweet. Now, accessibility. React Beautiful DND, uh, one of the things, well, probably. There's a lot of things I like about that library, but the thing that I really like is that it has accessibility uh, like thought of as a first class citizen in the library. And that really slowed its development down in a big way, but I think it's sort of changed a lot. Uh, I think that like React Beautiful DND's keyboard accessibility like brought light to a really dark place, I think on the web, like historically drag and drop had not been an accessible place and to, yeah, the amount of time we put into making that work well, not as an afterthought, but as something that worked truly well, uh, was, yeah, I'm really proud of that. Um, and it works out of the box, right? You don't need to think about it. You come for, come for a physical feeling UI, you get accessibility for free. So that's the good, the bad. Uh, it relies on changing the screen reader mode, screen reader modes, uh, for JAWS, which is not great. Feedback was that this is pretty crap, pretty bad actually. This isn't this doesn't happen on voice over on Mac, but you do need to do it on JAWS. And most critically, and most something I've just been thinking about so much is directional movement doesn't make a lot of sense when you can't see. So let's think about this UI. To do drag and drop with pragmatic then you press spacebar and then you move the arrow keys around. Like what if you can't see, like, what do you think is going to happen when you press those arrow keys? Like, you don't know what that user interface looks like. Like, what is to the right? Like, what is to the left? Yeah, I've been thinking about that so much since someone raised that to me. I was like, I had not thought of that, right? Like, they don't know. Like, they might not know what a board is. Like, it's a pretty abstract concept. Here I am, I'm getting, yeah. It's just really interesting, like directional movement, I don't think makes a lot of sense for somebody who doesn't see. Okay, so the feedback we kind of got was that React Beautiful DND, like it's good, like it's a good stepping stone, but it's not ideal. So what are we gonna do for pragmatic drag and drop? Um, we did lots of research, mostly by Declan Wan again, who's on the team, into lots of different alternatives and there's some really, and there's some cool ones that have kind of emerged after React DND, beautiful DND as well. The thing we pressed up against a lot is that ultimately the web platform drag and drop is not accessible. It just is not. And that sucks. I think it's a missed opportunity 
I think wouldn't actually be too hard to make it accessible, but it's not. So what do we do with that? Uh, so our solution was to embrace the idea of alternative flows. And I think this is actually, I'm biased, but I think it is the best, best solution. So what do I mean by alternative flows? Alternative flows, especially in the drag and drop space, is saying that like not every user needs to achieve the same outcome through the exact same steps. Okay. So if you think about moving a card from a column to another, you can achieve that with a drag and drop operation, but you can also achieve it with something like this. Like add a triple dot menu to a card. They can get, that's just like a standard menu. They can tab to it, open it, use the standard like ARIA stuff, arrow down to it, move card to column B. You know, that could be like change status to in progress, whatever. Like they don't even need to know what a board is or whatever the experience is to be given some very clear information about what it is that they're achieving. I think this is really cool and this is actually really cheap. Um, here's me using it in action. This is like a loom that I recorded a while ago when I was playing with this. I might even skip it. I think it goes for too long. Uh, but this is just sort of showing it kind of working in, this, in the context of the board. Um, so this is us doing some user testing with somebody who uses a, who has poor vision and uses screen readers as their primary driver. And they loved it. They love this. This is like, this is what they want. This is, so that was really cool. Um, yeah, but thought a lot about this. So what we've done is we've created, there's no like universal pattern for every single experience that's always going to work. So, so what we've done is we've created a guide, yeah, a guide and like actual code pieces that people can assemble to add accessibility to that experience, right? Because we just can't create a one solution fits all for every particular case. Now, there is a drawback to this, obviously, that people will just ignore it. Um, so I hope that in the future we can invest even more time into, because we've gone started low, but then you can aim high. So you can aim for, say, a table component that has built, like these affordances built in. Right? So makers don't have to worry about it every time they're doing a table. But having those lower level building blocks allows us to build layers on top. Cool. And lastly, maybe not lastly, but migration. So we have a lot of code in React in Atlassian that's written in React, beautiful DND. We want to get it over to Pragmatic, drag and drop. Um, is this champion again, Declan? Uh, so this is a, a video showing React, beautiful DND. It's that example we saw before. Um, he's been working on a migration layer where that code didn't actually change at all. And, and it's being powered by Pragmatic, drag and drop. Um, so it's a new package that we're working on, which has the exact same API and behavior as React Beautiful DND, but actually uses pragmatic DND under the hood. Obviously, the visual experience changes from that physical feeling experience to those lines, and uh, but you also get the React Beautiful DND keyboard experience as well. So we've rebuilt that, but with in this migration layer, so that we can move over all the people that are in very quickly um, without changing anything. And then we can worry about iterating on that keyboard story later, but we can kind of get rid of another of that library across the company. While I'm here talking about this, uh, what's, what's the performance of this migration layer? So it, it, you lose about one third of the performance benefits um, by using it because it's doing more and it has to kind of go back into React in quite a big way, uh, but that's fine. Um, so you get to about two thirds of the benefits just by, we're gonna have a code mod that's just gonna swap over some import statements. Uh, that's pretty sweet. So while we're here, what's the future of React Beautiful DND? Uh, don't ask me too much. Uh, that'll, it, it's a changing space, but the reality is that when we've kind of called out on the project that you know, we're not investing in it, we haven't for a while and we will, do any kind of security stuff that comes up. But I mean, stepping back, React Beautiful DND is pretty out of sync with what we're trying to do at Atlassian anyway, uh, which is very fast UIs having solution, solution that kind of will work across lots of different tech stacks, et cetera. So 
pretty unlikely that we'll be continuing to invest in that. But if you are on that and you're interested to try you know, pragmatic ND, there's that migration layer uh, for you. Uh, so can you use pragmatic drag and drop today? Like I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna convert my apps over. Uh, not yet. <laughs> well, sort of, soon though, yeah, soon. So the docs are ready-ish, but they're not public. They're on it behind on, on like our staging. There's a few kind of, we've, we've been focused on some big production migrations internally first. So this is sort of good, but not great. And so we have to get through a few more hurdles before we turn that on publicly. So if you started today, you're gonna have a pretty hard time without the docs, honestly, so I wouldn't do it. Um, you, the package is there on NPM. That package name is likely to change in the next few weeks. So you've been warned. But I mean, it's, it's, this is early access stuff, but it's really cool and it's in production now and it's gonna be in Atlassian and we go through quite a lot of quality gates to get that out. Uh, so it's in a good state. I would use it in my, my own personal apps for sure. It's something that I've wanted for a very long time which is I want to add drag and drop to my app, but I don't want to pay a lot for it. So, um, so yeah, you can definitely try it out if you want, but it's going to be pretty hard without docs. It's got types, but it might be a bit tricky without the docs. Uh, you can go to that performance site that I mentioned if you're interested. Uh, drag and drop performance comparison. I know it rolls off the tongue. Uh, and yeah, if you're interested in this project and you kind of would be like to know when it when it is a bit more stable and when the docs are released. Um, yeah, just follow me on Twitter and I'll, I'll share that out. That's all I have for you tonight. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, I'd love I'd love to. Um, to be real, like I, I in the past I've done a lot of stuff outside of work. Um, so since lockdown, we had our third kid, which is awesome. I love him so much. There, yeah, thanks. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm trying to be intentional about my time outside of work to to be with them. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of like almost a full time parent and a full time worker. And that doesn't leave a lot of room for that kind of stuff. Although I would love to, and I hope to write a blog. I had one slide which touched on a few things about what we could do to make the platform better. And I, I'm actually hoping to turn it into quite a long blog because I think there are some things that are not that hard to do or within reach uh, to evolve the platform to eliminate a lot of these rough edges. Whether or not we'd still need pragmatic DND after that, I think so, but it would still make everyone's life a lot better and we'd have to send a lot less code down. Yeah, so what I was saying, well, yeah, okay. So to be clear, Basically, under normal conditions, under in, in, and in fairly large data sets, you're running at 60 frames per second on both. Now, obviously, frames per second is a funny measure because it'll depend on the hardware. So, the worse the hardware, doesn't you could be running the most basic stuff, and it could be running at pretty low FPS. So, that's just saying that slide was just saying like they both comfortably hit same 60 frames per second under basically most usages. You'll know when you're not in in that case. And so that what that slide afterwards was is that I had created an evil little function that was effectively doing an animation frame loop and like blocking the main thread for significant periods of time to artificially drop the frame rate in the browser. So when you saw seven FPS down the bottom, the browser was like unable to run at 60 FPS. It was only running at seven or six or whatever it was running at. And so that was showing that when the browser's struggling for whatever reason, React's beautiful DND does not feel very good because it's also running at that seven FPS, whereas pragmatic DND, the drag preview is running at 60 FPS, even though the browser itself is only running at six or seven.
I mean, the general question, how do I feel about it? It feels like it's getting better all the time. Is it where I would love it to be? No. What I would love as an engineer is to have more accurate information ahead of time. It seems like often the answer is just like, push it out to production and measure it, <laughs> which doesn't, it kind of feels a bit like cheating. I, I, I wonder if there is a better way. Um, I know there's been a lot of people who have tried. Uh, I'd love a, yeah, a, solu a good solution for that. I, I put a lot of effort in. It sounds strange, like one engineer, like why am I spending my time on that uh, lighthouse thingy, trying to whatever. Uh, yeah, I know there's been efforts, at least in Atlassian and, and in other places to, to create tooling to get more accurate ahead of time benchmarking, specifically for load. Uh, in terms of frames per second, we do have the performance observer where you get notified of long, ta long tasks. That's okay, because you can listen for those. Uh, this is not my area of expertise, like monitoring production. Uh, a lot of the FPS stuff that you saw there was um, essentially just on my local, yeah, with throttling, yeah, which I wish was, that was a better answer. Yeah, probably. I mean, yes, we should probably uh, write about this. We haven't even like put our docs out publicly yet with all that information in it. Um, yes, that would be great. And we definitely should. Uh, and at least even just, I mean, we've done user testing, but yeah, like why not? That sounds, that would be awesome. Yeah, great. I can show you a bit of the journey. So, a lot, so it's been, from the original idea, it's been, whoa, about a year and a half now. Um, so I'll get, break it down. So we have innovation weeks at Atlassian, where we just get a week to just kind of innovate. And I had the idea about pragmatic drag and drop before then, and I built a spike in that week. And it was nothing like what it ended up being like, but it kind of worked and I wrote a blog about it and a lot of people within Atlassian were actually really keen. Some people extremely keen and actually someone had then spiked adoption in Confluence and someone had also spiked adoption in Jira, just on my like hacky innovation week code. And they saw some really staggering results just on that. Then I kind of yeah, the magical dance of how do you get something funded in a, in a, in a company, um, but that happened, you know, I think it was a very compelling narrative around this project. And also internally, we were staring down the barrel of some fairly significant investment into React Beautiful DD. So something I mentioned that is that tree support was dropped in version 12, um, but the plan was to bring it back. Um, it was just sort of a temporary thing. But then kind of development got defunded. So we're kind of in this awkward state where some things need tree and so they need version 11. And some things were on version 12 or 13 and they need, and, and so sometimes you could even get duplicates. So we're gonna have to, we're exploring options about, okay, well we have to pull like the tree stuff back. It was gonna be a fairly big project. And so this kind of land, like, like around that time, it was kind of like, well, rather than this investment into something that we know is heavy and why not pivot into this direction? So it's kind of all those things came together. Um, yeah, and then we've been working on it for, yeah, since about March last year. Um, I'd say it's gone through one full rewrite. Yep, which always happens. Like, it will always happen. Um, yeah, so I think maybe two months in, stuff just wasn't working the way I wanted. And um, yeah, basically, not started again, because you're learning as you go, but the patterns changed a lot, and it's kind of what we have now. Yeah, no, it was, yeah, I'm trying more and more just to do engineering out work. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're moving in the right direction. You kind of just, yeah. So about maybe the six month mark of that, no, less. Maybe four month mark. We, we started integrating into products. So we've been integrating basically as early as we can um, into Jira roadmaps was the first one. 
I think Ops Genie is another one. Um, Jira Work Management, they've already shipped. Going into Confluence now. Uh, yeah, so we've kind of tried to integrate very early. So it means that its development has not been, yeah, which is great, like the result is amazing, you know. You won't, you'll learn so much by integrating with like, and these are big apps, right? These are not like kitty apps, these are big apps, right? With lots of users, lots of complexity. So I think the result is great. But yeah, so that's, that's been the journey so far. Yeah. While it's going, I mean, I would probably be, I definitely think about software basically all the time. I try not to. Um, yeah, yeah, it's actually something I, I've been actively trying to stop because I don't think it's good for my mental health no, to always be on. Um, but I do, and I do do a lot of research just on my phone and whatever. Like, yeah, but I'm, I'm actively trying to stop because I don't think it's good. Yeah, drag previews are just a mess. I found a good answer for that. The, one, the, the most recent one, which is one that I think part of my soul has died <laughs> and I'll never get it back, is there's this really evil bug in Chrome where after a drop, if you look back on my Twitter feed, you'll see it. After a drop, whatever element is visually under the user's cursor, after you've updated the UI, the browser will be like, I'm going to give a selection to that element, even if it's completely unrelated to the drag. And that was hell to get around because what you, it's really hard to spot. You get it once we pick one, even after, like, it took a while to actually pin down, but basically they were getting like random enter events on something. And yeah, if you, you can look it up and you can see the fix that I put as well because I linked the Chrome issue and it's horrible. Like, it's horrible. I, I weep that I needed to write that code. Like, the code's fine. Like, it's fine, the code's fine. I like the code, but the fact that I needed to do it. So I do this really, without showing you the bug, it's hard to explain, but um, essentially I have to disable pointer event. After the drop, after the drop, I have to disable pointer events on the body, enable pointer events on whatever the user is currently over, but only that element, the elements underneath need to have pointer events disabled um, so that you can still continue to click and interact with the element that you're currently over, but it doesn't kind of lead to these other problems for these other cases that I won't go into. And then when the user moves in any way, and anything changes, we can revert all that stuff because the browser's fixed itself. <laughs> and that's like one bug fix. I think there's about six or seven in there. Yes, use the platform, they say, but like, so get on this in that, like the platform is, like it's actually great, like it's actually, there's a lot of power there, but it's just terrible to work with, so. No. Yeah, we did a big like, at the start, spent a lot of time like, thinking about all the features. Yeah, it's basically whatever the platform can do. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a convenience and safety wrapper over the platform, really. So if you can do it with the platform, yes. Yeah.